I'm gonna call for Dr. Richardson. They say that they yeah. Four seven. Let's have the four seven to seven. But leave it. Come on. Because he's really the person. Relax. The boys just told me don't do my usual. I'm known to be the mouth. I'm a little shy, bashful kind of guy. The problem is, I start talking and I'm shy and bashful when it comes time to shut up. I didn't hear the beginning of, of the, this particular session because as you saw, the vehicle was crowded and I had to make a pit stop and I wound up here when I am, but I heard Henry's last portion and it had to do with the first war. You know, as he told you, we fought in two wars. The first war was fight Jim Crow so that we could then go and fight his and our enemies. And that was the humongous battle of all that both groups shared. Let me give you a little background. Henry touched on the fact that there was the bomber group, and this is true. The bomb group had four squadrons in it, just as the 332nd fighter group had its four squadrons, the 99th, the 100th, the 301st, 302nd. We had the 6th, 17th, 18th, and 19th uh, bomb squadrons. But what happened was the whole event, as you well know, was choreographed to fail by the people in authority. They would not allow us to even apply for the Air Corps at the beginning of the war. And as a result of a lot of public pressure and a lot of support that we had from the, at that point in time, a powerful black press across the country. In Philadelphia, for example, we had three powerful papers at one time. We had the Philadelphia Tribune, the Philadelphia Independent, you had the uh, Pittsburgh Courier and the Afro-American. That was the way it was throughout the land. And the reason for that was because the white press would only insert anything in the paper that uh, about a black person, nothing at all, unless unless it was a rape or a murder, then that would make front page. If it was anything decent, like that there was a, a marriage or somebody graduated from college, no mention whatsoever. So the best that was more powerful than it would be today. Normally I can talk to this guy, but I won't try it today. But let him have his say. So, as a result of the, the national press wanting to know why their bright young men didn't have a chance to sh show their talents along with the rest of the population, their furor to get us admitted together with that fact in attracting the support of a lot of the political population, that added together with there was an election year when it was time for Franklin Delano Roosevelt to be re-elected. Add to that the fact that a lawsuit was filed by a college graduate from Howard University, a guy named Yancey who filed a federal suit against uh, once he had been rejected for application. The simple fact being, he satisfied all the requirements that they had and they didn't take him only for one reason. He then in turn Followed, uh, filed a suit, and that suit was then supported by the entire population. Bottom line, the real president, Eleanor Roosevelt, happened to, come, <laughs> happened to come to Tuskegee, and she took a ride with a black civilian pilot. We like to think of him as the father of black military av aviation. We called him Chief Anderson. His name was Alfred Anderson from Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Uh, she took a ride with him, and uh, for whatever reason it, it motivated her to do it, we don't know, we don't care, but we're grateful to her. Because between the political pressure, the pressure of the press, and that good old pillow talk, Roosevelt issued an order that we'd be admitted. But he didn't say how. And the commanders who had been prompted and led by a 1925 report from the War College, right here in good old Pennsylvania, at Chambersburg, I mean at Carlisle, which said that as a result of their 
investigations. Black people were cowards. They were stupid. They had the, uh, smaller brains than white people, and they did not have the ability to deal with intricate equipment such as an airplane. And that had been distributed throughout the several commands. Well, Roosevelt said you got to take them, but he didn't say how you have to take them. So then the power structure decided that they would take them in, in a, uh, a, a token gesture and designed the, the program to fail. And here's how they did it, a very simple matter. They created a, a funnel. You know a funnel starts wide at the top and it narrows down to the bottom, a very small stream comes out. So once they opened the, the, the application process and there were quite a few more uh, young men of color who were educated, were talented, and who could pass the entrance examinations, the, they were put into the large part of the funnel. And then from that point on, each step of the way, you had to wean them away so that at the bottom came out, came out a very, very small stream. Example, uh, one step of the way, I, I'll use myself as, as a, an example of how the funnel works. Once the applications were made open, they were giving examinations in the, uh, the um, in custom house, the old custom house at Second and Chestnut. The, the, uh, the process was, I'll give you the day that I went down to take my examination. There must have been 200 or more young men in there, of which about 12 or 15 of them happened to have been black. Uh, at the end of the, the examination, it was a four hour entrance examination, you sat there and waited for a while, and when you were dismissed, they would tell you, if you had passed, they would tell you what to do next, and if you didn't pass, they would just let you go on about your business. Well, uh, maybe 150 other of the people that passed there, four of the black guys passed, and I was lucky to be one of them, and to give you an example of the, of, of the support you got for that. At that time, we were at Second and Chestnut, the, the induction center and the examination center was at 32nd in Lancaster, almost walking distance. Well, at that age, you could walk there. When the four of us came through that had passed, they told us to come up to Middletown, the airport just outside of Harrisburg, for the same physical examination. Now, that's support. That's supposed to start to dis discourage you. All right, from that point on, Biloxi, Mississippi, had Keesler Field, which was the classification center, one of the major classification centers in the East Coast. Now, when you go in there, there were some people, I don't know how many, uh, uh, brothers were there at the time, uh, I didn't count them, but there was a two-week session of, uh, of examinations that were this, they were standard nine. You had a general intelligence uh, uh, examination and some other basic examinations and then there were psychological examinations, psychomotor examinations, and there were a total of nine of them that had to be passed. And those standard nine we eventually nicknamed and called the stay nine because if you pass you stayed and if you didn't, it was bye-bye. Well, well, the group that was there, the four of us that went there, immediately they got rid of two of them. Uh, that's the beginning of that small portion of the funnel. From that point on, we went to the Tus to Tuskegee Institute, now Tuskegee University, to a college training detachment, which lasted four months. Tuskegee happened to be uh, been one of the five black colleges that had been accepted by the military to conduct these courses. They were courses that were of particular significance to the Air Corps. For example, don't, no matter what college you had been to or what you had taken, here they concentrated on uh, uh, aerodynamics, physics, uh, meteorology, things that were specifically addressed to the field of aviation. Now, out of that group, there were quite a few number of, of people there in various stages of, of, of that we whittled it down some more. Bottom line, I'm, I'm not going to talk my usual two weeks because we've got to be out of here by tomorrow night. Uh, the, the thing here, I want to just show you how the funnel worked and then I'm going to stop. Uh, as a result of the persons coming out of that college training detachment, you developed a pool and the, the, the funnel hadn't gotten quite narrow enough. And these gentlemen will tell you that the average class started with anywhere from 65 to 92 or 95 persons. The largest class that ever got out of the other end of the funnel was I think about 22. Is that right, fellas? All right, but that was toward the end of the things that got good. 
Yeah. This guy, this guy's a kid. He's a young kid. He, he's, only, he's one year short of being 80. So he's a, this kid's smart. He's pointing out the fact that by the time he got out, and at that time, Roosevelt had died and give him hell, Harry was president, and Harry took charge. He issued Executive Order 9981 that said, you will, you will keep these boys moving. Uh, and what had happened by that time, I think the highest test, he says, was 38, but that was in 45. I'm talking about from 40, from 41 to 44. I think, anybody else got a higher number? 22, somewhere in is about the average. Luther, how many were in your class? When you graduate? 100 started, 20 finished. There you are. 80% lost. That's how the funnel went. And some of the instructors, after a couple of drinks with